Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. This is a lunar lander. That's a different series we're starting on Smarter Every Day. This is a nuclear submarine. We are now really far into the nuclear submarine deep dive here on Smarter Every Day. And today we're going to answer a question that I've always wanted to know. Submarines are designed to stay underwater as long as possible. And sometimes they can't even go to the surface if they want to, like right now. The USS Toledo is currently under the ice, which makes it impossible to surface to get fresh air. How do you create oxygen on on board a submarine because if you think about it if you're on board with a lot of your crewmates and we're taking in oxygen and we're breathing out carbon dioxide eventually the atmosphere on the inside of the submarine is going to become soured so today on smarter every day we are going to investigate how to create oxygen on board a submarine and how to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we're gonna have two ways to do both. Let's get on board the Toledo and let's understand how to create breathable air on a submarine. Let's go get smarter every day. Okay, so in order to keep people alive on the boat, we have to have an atmosphere at each location where each body is that can keep that one body alive, right? So ventilation is key. If you have different compartments that can be closed at different times on boats for different reasons, for example, a huge pileup of people in the place where everybody sleeps, you're gonna be creating a lot more carbon dioxide in that location than other places on the boat, but we have to keep the entire atmosphere livable throughout the boat. So in order to do this, they monitor the atmosphere of every position in the boat that's important with a system called CAMS, the Central Atmospheric Monitoring System. So the first thing we're going to do is go figure out how to measure the atmosphere at any place in the boat, and then we'll address how we deal with it with carbon dioxide or oxygen or whatever. Anyway, let's go check out CAMS. I'm Destin. I'm Dow. Dow? How's it going? How do you spell that? D-O-W. D-O-W. Dow Jones. Awesome, man. Where are you from? I'm from Ohio. Oh, from Jefferson, Ohio. Cool, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So, so what what do you do up here? So, uh, share them. Well, I'm a machine man, auxiliary, or egginger. We're basically mechanics on the whole boat. We own practically 90% of the boat. So, where are you monitoring the oxygen levels? So, to monitor the oxygen levels, uh, it's in up in middle level called uh, CAMS, yeah. Central Atmosphere Monitoring Station. And uh, we have a couple of watch there that monitors oxygen levels on there. Can you show me that? Yes. Yep. Let me Let me get around you. We're going to see where the oxygen gets oh, monitored, okay. yeah. So this is in the middle of the boat? Yes. And uh, it has different stations we can monitor. It takes samples of the air to monitor our atmospheres. So right now, you're looking at how much O2 is on the boat. Yes. Carbon monoxide. I'm really glad that there's not any there. R114, so that's refrigerant? Yes. Yeah, so you're monitoring that as well. Basically monitoring the good gases and the bad gases, basically. Gotcha. So and so you've got CO2, hydrogen, nitrogen, water. That's cool. And so this is the total pressure on the yes, boat? Yes, it is. That's cool. Well, in each compartment it is. Like, like I was saying, we have different... Can you show me? Yeah. It's like we take different uh, sampli like sampling uh, panel index. We can turn the dial to different stations. So right now you're looking at the fan room. Yes. So if you wanted to go, what what's okay to look at? It's got a cheap power set quarters, cruise mess. Cruise mess? Cheap, yeah. And so this is updated? So it takes a second, so this bar has to go all the, all the way across for an update. Yeah. Kind of slow, but... So clearly you have some type of, you have some type of alarm that has to... Oh yeah. yeah. So if, if oxygen gets too high or... If your fridge gets too high or something gets too low, it'll alarm, it'll make a, a beeping sound. So in the event that we have a bad gas that, you know, we have a leak of refrigerant, for example, do you have a way of finding the leak? So, oh, I guess you could go to the panel and then you could select different sources and you can see where it's high. Yes. And so that isolates it to that section of the boat, right? Yes. But then how do you find the actual leak? Like if it comes down to a pipe, how do you find the leak on the pipe? So for like uh, R134, we have... Uh, we call them sniffers, and uh, they detect uh, where R134 is coming out of the piping or the plant, and uh, it'll alarm when uh, it detects it. So is it like a? It sounds like a Geiger counter when you get closer to it or something. Yeah, it does. So like, can I see one? Yeah. Yeah. Down some this is how the sausage gets made right here. This is how you keep yourself alive on a sub. Okay. 
they're like, I guess we'll just show him the oxygen stuff and then I'm really excited about this. The what? Sniffer. Oh. Sniffer. Can we look at sniffers? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Sniff away. This is it? Yep. So this is a universal refrigerant leak detector. So can you show me how to use it? Yeah. So this is what it looks like when we find a leak. So that's how that's how you find a leak. Yes, and then we can also switch to, to small, medium, large leaks. So if we're looking for a small leak, uh, put it to small because we won't detect it if it's large. You got it. Have it on a large setting. So we'll go through. I guess R134 right here. And you'll go through and you'll just drag. You'll drag it through the piping very slowly. So it's like coloring in kindergarten. Basically, yes. Just Do you have something like this for each bad gas? We have a Jager kit. It monitors, uh, it tests like the sample of the air. It looks like little tubes. You have to break and you have to pump air through it. And it'll indicate if there's that type of gas in the air. We also have a, so it's called the PHD-6. And that tells us the lower, the lower level explosive limit. So like for hydrogen, for example? Yes. Yeah, so you have a sniffer that does that. Is this the air conditioning? No, this is for the chill and freeze box, not keeping food cold. Oh, really? Yes. So is, that, is that on the other side of the wall or something? That's the upper middle level. So you got a chiller running up. Yeah, this is a refrigeration plant, yeah. All right, so the CAM system taught us that not only is it important to monitor oxygen and carbon dioxide, but any kind of gases that might leak out into the atmosphere and harm people. So the next thing, I told you there are two ways to create oxygen on the boat, right? So for the first way, uh, I got a little excited. I made a little 3D printed thing. We're gonna do a little experiment. We're gonna use electrolysis to create oxygen. Very excited about this. Here's how this works. You did this in like sixth grade science or something like that, but you get two electrodes and you put them up in the water and you put electricity on one electrode and you complete the circuit. And of course, H2O breaks into hydrogen and oxygen, right? So this was my thinking when I got on the boat. Well, I'm on a submarine. There's seawater all around the submarine. I can just take in as much seawater as I want. I have a nuclear reactor. I can just put electrodes, hook them up to the nuclear reactor, and then just put those in the seawater and I can provide oxygen for everybody on the boat. I'm a hero, right? Except I would have killed everybody on the boat and that I do not want to do that. This is why. If you run just straight up electrolysis on seawater with salt in it, N-A-C-L, you will liberate chlorine gas and hydrogen, not oxygen and hydrogen, and that's a really bad thing and that kills people. So we don't wanna do that. Before you run electrolysis on seawater, you must first purify it. And the way you do that is through a filtration system and also something called reverse osmosis. Now, reverse osmosis is complicated and I don't wanna go into the, the great depths of that right now, but there's a lot of stuff on screen right now and that's kind of what happens. Wonderful, okay, let's come back here. So electrolysis, the way Way we're going to do that is we have this super pure reverse osmosified water in our little contraption here but what we're going to do is we're going to add potassium hydroxide and when we add that and then we hook everything up to the nuclear reactor that potassium hydroxide acts like a catalyst and it more freely liberates the oxygen and the hydrogen for water and guess what you can breathe oxygen instead of the chlorine destin was going to try to pump into the sub that's how that works look at how big the difference is here on the left we did electrolysis on salt water you can see we ended up with hydrogen and chlorine gas which actually damaged the container on the right we did it with purified water using potassium hydroxide as an electrolyte and that broke it down into hydrogen and oxygen which is fine for the crew to breathe you make oxygen by electrolysis up up near the nuke is that yeah. what is that That's the, the AUG automated electro automated automated like electrolytic oxygen generator uh-huh and uh we use uh, water and a chemical called KOH or potassium hydroxide. Got it. And we essentially shock the water, which creates oxygen. And so it uh, takes water, O2 or H2O, and splits it from hydrogen and oxygen. And we use the oxygen 
have to breathe, obviously. Right. And then we send the hydrogen overboard. Okay, so I told you there were two methods to create oxygen on a submarine, right? The first method is electrolysis, which I knew about. The second method was a little bit counterintuitive to me. This is a match burning. And as you know from high school chemistry, burning means oxidation, meaning it is taking oxygen out of the atmosphere and creating a chemical reaction. So right now, this candle is now burning, meaning it's oxidizing. So when I heard someone on the boat say, hey, we're low on oxygen, we need to go light a candle, that was counterintuitive to me. And what's about to go down? Uh, we're about to burn chloride candles. So make oxygen from the cans right over there behind you. Yep. So you're gonna so, you're gonna burn this? Yeah, so the way this works is the candle itself is actually inside this container. And then we'll put them in a basket like this one right here. Yeah. And the basket will go inside here. But well, if we open this up, we have a little striker up here. Uh-huh. And on the tip of it is red phosphorus. So what we'll do is we'll have it go through here and once the candles are in, we'll take this, push it down and twist it, and that'll light the candles. Okay. And it lights kind of like a cigarette from what I've heard. I've never actually seen one lit, because um, we can't really leave the lid open when we light them, because that's a class delta fire. Uh-huh. And we can't really put those out. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, that's really about it. That's it? Yeah. Okay. And so, and it makes oxygen as you yeah. do it. How yeah, long does so it burn? Um, so each candle will burn for about 45 minutes to an hour. So both candles together, they can burn somewhere between 90 minutes to two hours. Really? Yes. Okay, so you're gonna burn two at one time? Yes. So, and so is this something you need to do or something you're just doing? Um, we mostly need to do it right now because our normal way of making oxygen with the AEOG, um, that's currently down. So this is sort of our backup method of creating oxygen. Got it, and so you're monitoring the oxygen level back here. Yeah, on right. Phase. So, so you're monitoring the oxygen level here, and if it's low, then yep. you burn the candle. Yep, and that'll help bring the oxygen levels back up to where we need to be. Okay, rock and roll. Learning. Science, XO, science. <laughs> <laughs> so is this your job? Uh, yeah, this is one of the extra things we do for our watch, so. Um, because one of my jobs is to actually monitor the atmospheres of itself. So whenever I notice that oxygen is getting low enough, I would have to make the recommendations to burn the candles. And then if the chief of the watch agrees, then we'll burn the candles. And this right here is a byproduct after we burn them. Okay. Uh, we call these clinkers. Honestly, I have no idea why we call them clinkers. Uh huh. And so you're opening the can back there, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah? Can you show can you show it to me? Absolutely. So this is the bottom of the can. We take off this protective cloth. Uh-huh. Pretty much helps keep the candle from being damaged while it's in the can. Do you have a flashlight? No, I don't have one on me. You need a flashlight? Perfect, thank you. This is the top of the candle. So as he was explaining to you about the striker that ignites it, when the striker goes through the lid, it presses down on this center piece here. Presses down on that? Yes, and the striker has a phosphorus tip. Yes, and sir. these candles can only be ignited due to a chemical reaction between the phosphorus and the chlorate of the candle. The chlorate? Yes. Okay, got it. And so that, that'll get it going? Yes, sir. Okay, let me get out of your way here. So this is a pretty hazardous activity then, because it involves fire on a submarine. Yes. Yes, sir. That was the one. one class of fire no one on the submarine ever wants to deal with. A class Delta fire, because it's a self oxidizing fire, so it makes its own oxygen. You've been here four and a half years, I've never watched You've never seen this happen? Yeah. So you're just slowly getting down to the chlorate? Yes, sir. So two candles. We burn two candles at a time. 
to pretty much maximize the out oxygen output of the candle burns. So this, when you touch the end with red phosphorus, starts burning, slowly burns, becomes this. Yes. This is the striker we actually use, just a nine inch nail, and this is the red phosphorus we were talking about. Gotcha. All right. uh, sir, for this part here, I am going to need to step back a little bit because I brought to pull the old candles out and those are extremely hot. Yes, sir. Which is why we got these heat protective gloves. So you're putting it in there and let it cool off. Um, here is something close to it, and you can just feel how hot it is. Just like put your hand right by it. Uh, actually, touch. Yeah, definitely don't touch that. Don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, because when these actually burn, they end up burning with, I believe it was 9,500 BTUs. Yeah. So they get extremely hot. Take the ignite it, press it through the lid. Let me hold it so we have a premature ignition. Can I come over here? <laughs> so you're about to ignite it? No. You are. I am? You are. <laughs> <laughs> now if you just grab, I can tell the light on for you. If you grab the igniter, press down and twist. Okay, you hold the light right on it. So push it down. Push down, yeah. press no, down and, and just twist it. Okay. Like that? Twist it fast, yeah, twist it. Press the uh, pull up on it. I see the smoke. So, yeah. if you feel right here, you can, you can feel the pressure coming out of this pipe. Yeah. And that is what tells that's us- That's where that the oxygen's coming out? Yes, sir. Yep. And that's that what tells us that the candle is ignited properly. Really? Yes, sir. So you're making oxygen now? I'm making oxygen right now. It's a you are a creator of oxygen. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, it wasn't until I got off the sub when I totally understood what was going on here, but the two main chemicals in this candle were iron and sodium chlorate. When you burn iron, that's adding oxygen to the iron and you're creating iron oxide, you're actually creating heat. That's the burning of the candle. But when you do that, there's also sodium chlorate in the candle and that heat from the iron oxide is liberating oxygen from the sodium chlorate. And in doing so, you actually get more oxygen from the chemical reaction. Now this is why this is important. If you think about it, if you're on the submarine and we had the nuclear reactor hooked up to the electrodes, right, or whatever, that's great. And you can just create as much oxygen as you want through electrolysis. However, if you ever lose power for whatever reason, you can just light a candle. And that requires no electricity whatsoever. As long as you have a solid candle and a way to contain the fire without it damaging anything on the boat, you can start that fire and create oxygen with no external power source whatsoever. The beauty of this oxygen candle oxygen generation technique is that the solid oxygen candle is in a very small volume, but it can create a tremendous amount of gas. This is very important for things like spacecraft. Americans and Russians have used oxygen candles in space for years, and only one time did it get out of control on the space station Mir. Oxygen candles are amazing. They're an effective, efficient way to create oxygen on board a submarine. Uh, how often do you burn these things? Uh, typically, when we have to burn candles, we do we light two candles every two hours. Once in the forward compartment, and once in the engine room. Yeah. We alternate every two hours. And you're constantly monitoring how much oxygen is... Yes, that's his job. To monitor the cams, our central atmosphere monitoring system, to verify oxygen levels throughout the ship. Okay, and so can you literally watch the uh, the oxygen level rise here? Uh, no, it won't rise up instantaneously like that because it burns over time. Yeah. So with that, what we'll see is the O2 tour right here might go up by three or four by the end of an hour or so. And then what we'll do is we'll take the pressure right here and the O2 tour because the O2 tour is partial, partial pressure. That's partial pressure? Yeah, that's yeah. partial pressure so we can figure out the oxygen percentage of that. So it usually doesn't change too much when we burn the candles because as they're burning, people are breathing still. So it might go up by a little bit, but it won't be like a huge drastic change. But it's, it's, like, a, it's like a continuously solving equation. You're just trying to like yeah. maintain, yeah, you're not we're, trying to rise. Yeah, no, we're not trying to really rise with these. 
are mostly trying to maintain a suitable atmosphere so that we can breathe still. That's awesome. All right, great. So we know how to get oxygen in the submarine in our environment now. We've got candles and electrolysis, but we still have the carbon dioxide problem. As we breathe out, we're creating carbon dioxide, and we have to do what's called scrubbing the CO2 from the atmosphere. So to do that, there's two processes we'll talk about. The first one involves a liquid chemical. We have uh, two Mark D Bravo CO2 scrubbers right here and right here. Uh, so this is what's letting us breathe. It is, yes. Yeah. So. What these machines are designed to do, they take uh, carbon dioxide out of the air. Uh, they do, they go, it's around 370 uh, cubic feet per minute, the air goes through. So we use this chemical called monoethanol amine, or... Say it slower. Monoethanol amine. Okay. Or called for short, MEA or amine. And... Uh, Where does it go in? So, air will come in to here. It comes out from the fan room. It's like the cycle it goes, air will go in. From the little blower, it'll suck, it'll pull in air in and go through the absorber tower. Yep. And uh, the amine sprayed over top of the air, and it absorbs all the CO2 out of the air, and the air goes back through the air purifier, and then it gets it gets it back out. So this is this is fresh air coming yes. out. Yes. And then from there, uh, or from the absorber tower, the amine, the rich amine, because it uh, has CO2 in it, gets pumped from the amine pump into the heat exchanger, which is right here, which basically preheats the amine before, the, before it gets to the boiler stripper. And the boiler stripper is under pressure, uh, which causes, higher pressure causes things that have higher, higher boiling temperature. Yep. So, uh, the, we boil the amine, and- And that removes the CO2? It releases it, yes. So where does the CO2 go? So after there, uh, it gets into the compressor, and gets compressed to seawater depth, so how deep we are, and then we send it overboard. What do you mean compressed to seawater depth? So, so it, it goes out as liquid CO2? It goes out, it goes out as uh, like gas CO2, but like different depths, the pressure, water pressure is higher, so it gets it off that way. So we, it compresses it to however deep we are, and then pushes it out. So it creates enough pr pressure to push it out. Oh, so, I got it. So water doesn't come back in. I see. Okay, let's break this down. Dow referred to the chemical being used as monoethanol amine, or MEA, also known as amine. A lot of submariner spouses complain about the amine smell in their clothes once they get back from being on tour. Anyway, this is a really interesting substance. He referred to two adjectives to describe amine. He said rich amine, and he said lean amine. If you think about rich amine, it's like a fizzy drink. CO2, or carbon dioxide, is in saturation in the liquid. Lean amine is like a flat coke. It has the ability to absorb CO2, but it's flat. It doesn't possess any of the CO2 in it at that time, right? So it's this ability to absorb CO2 that makes monoethanol amine so fantastic. I'm a visual learner, so let's take a look at this. Dow said there are two main components to this system. First, there's the absorber tower, and then there's the boiler stripper. First, air that has CO2 in it is blown into the absorber tower, where where lean MEA is sprayed through that air. The reason it's sprayed is because that increases the surface area between the carbon dioxide in the air and the lean amine. And that maximizing of the contact area promotes the absorption of CO2 into the lean MEA. Because the lean amine is flat and it wants to be fizzy, it starts to absorb that carbon dioxide out of the air and then it falls down to the bottom of the absorber tower where it pulls together in a rich state, meaning it has that CO2 in solution. I don't really understand this part, but Dow said there's a preheating function that happens before it moves over to the boiler stripper, but once it's in the boiler, the temperature of the rich amine is increased and the CO2 boils off, turning rich amine back into lean amine. That CO2 that then boiled off is compressed, like he said, to whatever pressure it takes to push it overboard. The deeper you are in the ocean, the higher the pressure has to be in order to push it out the side of the submarine. Once the CO2 is compressed and pushed overboard, somehow in that process it's turned into very fine bubbles so it dissipates out into the seawater without causing too much noise. That lean amine can then be used again to be sprayed back over into the absorber tower and the whole process starts over again and this is the magic of the whole thing. The fact that you can take that lean amine and then make it rich and then make it lean again is fantastic because that means you don't have any consumables on board and you can continuously scrub CO2 from the air indefinitely. That's a really big deal when you're trying to be underwater for an extended period of time so this amine 
submarine system is critical for staying submerged in a submarine. So MEA is one way to get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere in the submarine. The other way you probably heard of before, and that's lithium hydroxide. During the Apollo 13 incident, famously, the astronauts had to adapt the square lithium hydroxide canisters from the command module to the circular interface of the lunar module. And the reason is they had different lithium hydroxide canisters, which is basically just a way of passing air through this lithium hydroxide membrane or mesh or whatever you want to call it, basically just a chemical. Once it's exposed, it'll take the CO2 out of the air. So lithium hydroxide is used in a ton of different places. Rebreathers for Navy SEALs, uh, they take the CO2 out of the air. When an astronaut does an EVA, they use lithium hydroxide in the spacesuit to get the CO2 out of their spacesuit. The beauty of using lithium hydroxide to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere is just like the oxygen candle. If the power goes out and you don't have a way of running your MEA system, you can just open these canisters even and just sprinkle lithium hydroxide out on the bunk in the sailors like where they sleep and as long as it's exposed to the air it will scrub the CO2 from the atmosphere. It's a fantastic passive means of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere so you can survive on board the submarine. So in summary, how to breathe on a submarine. You've got to make oxygen and you've got to scrub CO2. The primary ways to do this for oxygen, electrolysis and oxygen candles. To scrub CO2, it's going to be monoethylene amine and lithium hydroxide. You do all this just right at just the right amounts and you can breathe underwater on a submarine. This episode of Smarter Every Day is sponsored by Raycon. Raycon is a company that makes fantastic earbuds. I've been running a lot lately. I have been putting many, many miles on the road using Raycons to listen to music, audiobooks. I love these things. My favorite thing, though, is there's a little bitty button on the side of the earbud itself. And if you are running and you tap the button, it'll pause everything you're listening to. I know that sounds like a little deal, but it's a big deal. When you're running and a lady comes up to you and she's got a little dog and you want to say hi to the dog or whatever, boom, pause. I can engage with a human. I can keep running. They're great. This is my dog, Princess Booper Snoot. I just wanted you to see her. She's cute. Isn't she great? She's great. I love my Raycons. If you want to check these out, you can get them by going to buyraycon.com slash smarter. That gets you 15% off any order you want. There's two different models that I recommend. There's the Everyday E25 and the Performer E55. This is the Performer E55. The cool thing about the Performer is that you have wireless charging as an option. You also have a USB-C charging option. But the way it works is you basically put the earbuds in the case here, in the case itself, charges the earbuds. They're fantastic. They are like half the price of other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good. If you go to buyraycon.com slash smarter, pick out any color you want. When you get Raycons, they come with all these little adapters so you can tune the Raycon earbud to your specific ear hole size. It's like an adapter for whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. They're great. You'll find the perfect ear hole fit for you. <laughs> yeah, buyraycon.com slash smarter, 15% off your order. I highly recommend them. There you go. So here's where we're at in the Smarter Everyday Deep Dive series into submarines. We've learned about all this stuff. There's a ton of things. We've, we've talked about food. We've talked about oxygen now. We've talked about all this stuff. We are coming up on surfacing the submarine, which is fantastic. So if you're interested in subscribing to Smarter Everyday, that'd be amazing. I would greatly appreciate it. If not, no big deal. I'm just grateful that you're along for the ride, literally. So. Thank you so much for watching Smarter Every Day. I'm grateful. Uh, feel free to consider supporting on Patreon if that's your sort of thing. If not, also no big deal. Anyway, that's it. I'm Destin. Hope you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. Bye. So you and Dow work together? Yes. Me okay. and Dow are in the same uh, division. Okay, yeah. I figured out pretty quick. You, you, you're, the, you're the guys that keep things going on the ship. I like to believe so. <laughs> <laughs> the, the backbone of the submarine, if you will. And what was your name, sir? Betty Officer Watson. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Watson. Pleasure to meet yeah. you, Yeah, and you, sir? I might test you, Palmer. Pleasure. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thanks. Appreciate it. No problem. So here's where the oxygen's coming out. Ooh, it's getting hotter too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it oh, gets yeah. hot quick. Thank you. You're really smart. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> where, where did you learn all this? Just join the Navy. Yeah? I mean, I learned like mechanical stuff from my grandpa and stuff and my dad. And you just you just came into the Navy and you learned all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Especially the submarine force. They teach you a lot. You have to learn a lot because your life depends on it. Really? If something goes down. We're the ones that have to fix it. There's no one else out here to help us. It's up for us. It's pretty legit. Thank you very much. What was your name again? Uh, Pedersen Dow. Dow. Thank you.